So uh, I know I know, <laughs> I know Suzanne's watching, so she probably knows this one already. But uh, India just had the largest strike in human history, you guys. That's super fucking exciting to me. Um, and and we're going to talk about uh, uh, various different things de dealing with this, right? This is the largest strike. In, uh, this, 250 million people across the country uh, went on a day-long general strike. 250 million people. That's that's almost the entire population of America itself, right? So America is roughly what three hundred and fifty million people. I'm going to do a little math, you guys. I know I'm start. What a weird thing to do, Chris. You're you're starting you're you're starting a segment off with math in America. Uh, that's seventy one percent of the American population. Seventy one to seventy two percent of the American population. That's that's how many people in India went on strike almost three quarters of the american populace could you imagine if three quarters of the american people went on strike that's crazy that's crazy there is no way like what would <laughs> what would corporate media even say like it would become unignorable at that point if three quarters of the country went on a nationwide general strike. That would be in, that would be so wild. Now, not only was this a, a the, since this was a general strike, right? Not it wasn't just like one particular group. It was it spanned pretty much everything from uh, farmers, from traders, merchants, taxi drivers bus drivers right i mean it went down the gamut of blue collar white collar and it and it spanned a lot of the castes because india has a caste system it spanned a lot of castes as well uh, and what they were what they were fighting against is the neoliberal uh economic principles that were put into place in india and india has been going towards that path for a long time it was the modi government though that really really put those principles in place and i've talked about modi quite often and we'll we'll talk about him in in just a a little bit here um but you know the the problem is bad execution but neoliberalism in and of itself is a bad idea <laughs> like it's it's a bad idea it just commodifies everything it puts a price tag on virtually everything so um, whenever we talk about strikes, we got to talk about the demands, right? What, what were the 250 million people in India um, went on strike and what were their demands? This was a very organized thing. This wasn't just a hodgepodge thing where it, it just randomly comes together, right? That, that's one of the things about strikes that people uh, like corporate media will try to do is they'll just be like, oh, man, this thing just... Look at this, this hodgepodge of people coming together. Nobody knows. That was the thing with Occupy that they said. It was just like, oh, man, no one no one really knows what they're fighting for here. No one really knows what they're doing. No, no, no. Uh, in a lot of sense, when you have a movement that large, there is some organization behind it. But they don't want the general public to know that because if the general public just thinks that this is some ragtag fucking, you know, random group of people that... Uh, that that fucking came together then <laughs> like who gives a shit right like that's the way that they frame it so but they went one step beyond with with this with the strike here is that there was no media coverage and i'm going to talk about that too but uh i want to talk about what their demands were because i think their demands are important especially for uh by the way i'm from india i was born there i got my citizenship uh late last year so um, but I but I was born in India. That's that's part of the reason why this story is like super fucking cool to me that India was able to do something like this. Right. Uh, so first one is the withdrawal of anti-farmer laws and anti-worker labor codes. Uh, there's a problem in India right now with Bayer Monsanto coming in and taking over their uh, crops um, and they'll uh, put in suicide seeds, right? Uh, they've been buying up farmers' lands, and what are the ways that they do it? And this has been happening in South America, or this was happening in South America too. I can't remember if they uh, defeated Bayer Monsanto in in South America or not. Um, but 
uh, they'll basically these seeds will cross pollinate with the seeds of other farmers. And they'll basically say, oh, you're growing Monsanto crops. More of your crops are Monsanto crops than not. And now we're going to buy your farm. So essentially what was happening is that in India, a lot of people's livelihoods were being taken away. Um, and then there's pesticides and poisons that they spray on all these crops and stuff. And that was another problem, too, because it was killing off the, uh, the the crops that these people were growing. And then Monsanto would come in and buy up their farms anyway. So so all of this stuff was just to kind of gain control of agriculture. Um, and it was leading to farmer suicides in India. That was actually one of the leading causes of suicide in India was uh, farmers couldn't put food on their table. They were losing their livelihood. They were not able to, you know... Um, they were not able to to do what they were trained to do, right? Like what they actually wanted to do with their lives. Uh, so this will basically prevent that. That's an anti-farmer law. That's a pro-corporate law. Uh, not just that, but if you look at corporate labor from the West, this, this also kind of regulates corporate labor from the West. There's a lot of, um, I think Westinghouse maybe wanted to build a power plant in India a couple of years back. Uh, which is crazy, but <clears throat> there was a lot of protests that defeated that power plant. But, um, the reason why these companies, these capitalist companies go to countries like India is because the value of the dollar, uh, like the, the dollar exchange rate in, in India is, I think it's when I was there last year. Uh, I believe it was like 70 rupees to a dollar. It's 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 lopsided in favor of the dollar, which means that they don't have to pay people all that much. And they can get away with paying them less as an hourly wage or less as a, as a as an annual salary. And they're fine and they make more money up at the top. Right. So so they outsource these jobs so that they can make more money. And this is not beneficial to India. It's not beneficial to America. It's beneficial to a small group of people uh, that are getting away with corporate fraud. And they can get away with corporate fraud because it's happening in a different country. Right. So if America's law and this is sort of the argument that conservatives throw out there all the time to like regulate corporations like, oh, well, if we regulate corporations in, in America, they'll just go and take their jobs overseas where there's lax on corporate regulation. And the reason why there was lax on corporate regulation in India is because they want the business to come in. Um, Modi implemented this thing called India, India now or India or, or make in India. Sorry, not India. India now is their uh, tourism campaign. <laughs> um Make in India. Make in India was basically they wanted to bring in an influx of industry and manufacturing jobs. Um, and uh, they basically wanted everything to be made in India. Right. And so that they could have a little bit more. Again, this is sort of this neoliberal measure to like increase the economy to to make the GDP better. Uh, which is something that the, the the conservative party, the BJP party, which lines a lot more with the Democratic Party in America, will will kind of will will kind of point out. But if you regulate, what they're calling for in this first demand is if you regulate that, then then there is there's no there's no corporate malfeasance that they can do in India. So even if they outsource in India, they have to follow strict regulatory rules. Um, so. That's one of the things that 250 million people on this general strike are calling for, right? It, to to prevent uh, corporate farm, uh, corporate farming uh, for for companies like Bayer Monsanto to come in and and destroy the lives of farmers, and for actual corporate regulations so that workers can get paid what they are actually worth in India. The next one, this is uh, uh, this is interesting. Seven seventy five hundred rupees per month. Um, I'm going to do something real quick here. Uh, let's see. I'm going to do rupee to dollars and see if I can find an exchange rate. So I'll say $1. So $1 is 73, 73 rupees, roughly. 74 rupees, roughly, right? Uh, so 7,500 would be 101 102 US dollars. So roughly they're asking for 102 US dollars per month um as as universal basic income but 
uh, 10 kilograms of food for needy families. So essentially, I mean, this is not a lot, right? But, but the costs of things in India are so different. Uh, and the and the cost of living in India is so different um, because of the caste system and the way different societies are bu built in. I hate the caste. I think the caste system is total bullshit. It's antiquated and it needs to go. Just like the class system in America fucking needs to go. There's no fucking difference between the two of them. Um, it's a whole stand up routine that I wrote. <laughs> Uh, and I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to do it here because it needs to be, uh, reworked. And that was one of the things I was going to do on tour this year. Anyway, whatever. But uh, here's the thing is, is part of the demands here is universal basic income and to cover food for, for needy families, for families that actually need food. Right. And they're not asking for a lot. $102 a month is not a fucking lot. Right in America, the, the 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 standard of living, the universal basic income was two grand a month. That's what Bernie Sanders, uh, Tulsi Gabbard was proposing, and then eventually it got co-opted by um, some of the more mainstream corporate Democrats. Right, like Kamala Harris and Cory Booker were talking about it. Uh, the squad pushed it, but really did nothing about it. Pramila Jayapal was the only one that really fucking came in. Um, with uh with an actual universal basic income plan that nancy pelosi was like we're not going to do that and you need to shut the fuck up no nancy you need to shut the fuck up and actually listen to the real progressive in the office right but her entire permala jaypal's entire caucus went against her on the universal basic income idea because uh yas queen fucking nancy pelosi was like no we're not going to talk about it because bolshevism you know like she was going to do that bullshit and so she basically quit. Pramila Jaipal was like, I have no support in con like I'm I'm fucking I'm the odd man out here. Uh, so universal basic income was basically squashed back in June under the CARES Act, uh, which was just another corporate handout. And if India pulls this off and even if it's one hundred and two dollars a month, there is no excuse for America at this point. Right. Because the conservative argument is, you know, because Europe's doing it, <clears throat> European countries are doing it. Right. Like European countries are act, um, putting universal basic income in. The neoliberal and conservative argument is, well, we're not Europe here. OK, we're different. American capitalism is different. It helps people pull up by the bootstraps, does all of these things. And. They they can kind of write it off because it's this waspy like white these white nations mostly uh, except for Spain they're they're also brown uh, Portugal also like you know so it, it becomes complicated even though you can't really claim that Europe is all white because Europe is also as diverse as America is. <laughs> so it's like it's crazy to go but that's how they kind of look at Europe right so they can kind of say like well those white people are different that that white country is a little different. But once India starts doing it, right, and India looks, uh, people look down on India because it's a developing nation. It's the same reason why we look down on uh, various Middle Eastern countries, various African countries, because they're not developed. They're developing um, or they're third world countries. So, so you know, the first world countries can come in and, and, and help them out they, because they're better. That's, that's, the, that's the way that fucking things are, are seen. It's part of the uh, conversation. But if a developing nation figures out how to give universal basic income to its people first what excuse does america have being that it is the greatest country in the world and a country like india which america looks down on has figured out a way to feed and take care of its people that's the thing you won't hear about venezuela is venezuela despite american sanctions still canceled rents Still provided food to, food to its people. Still took care of the, their their citizenship. And and here we are in America, greatest country on earth, the richest richest country on the planet, and we have food lines. We have millions of people getting getting taken off of health care. What excuse does America have? None. It would lose all of the fucking excuses. What okay, Nancy Pelosi can't legitimately come out and be like, "Well, we're we're different than India." By what? By how are we different than India? It's a country with a larger population. It's a country with 
uh, a, you know, a, a struggling economy that, that you claim is far more struggling than yours. And you and they were able to implement a social safety net. So that's part of the thing of, of uh, you know, they're, they're not going to talk about it. This is another interesting one. This is part of the demands. It's 200-day work year, higher wages, and to expand worker rights into urban and rural areas, right? Super important to do, especially in India, to, to go into the urban and rural areas to expand worker rights because that's part of the reason why uh, people get people get taken advantage of, essentially, um, is because in the in the urban areas, there's not a lot of people that that have rights i mean it's the same thing here right the rural communities don't get the same amenities and stuff uh that that the that us city folk have you know i've been to colfax iowa i've stayed in colfax iowa i i couldn't find a fucking restaurant and and um um a place with decent wi-fi in colfax iowa you know, I, I don't know how rich that town is. I don't know if workers are getting taken advantage of. Usually they're built around factories. I've driven through some of these places. And I got to tell you, uh, the amount of large factories I see and the amount of I mean, I, I, I've seen more fucking Lockheed Martin facilities than I have uh, food pantries, than I have food, not bombs areas. That's what we need. We need more areas where we can help feed people help educate people, not fucking Lockheed Martin headquarters. But in India, uh, you need that kind of stuff, right? I mean, you need that kind of stuff everywhere. But, you know, 200-day work year would essentially mean more vacation days. You'd actually have to honor holidays. How many times do these fucking CEOs go on vacation? You know, like they own fucking houses in the Finger Lakes, houses in Florida and shit. Like I took one vacation. The first vacation I took was last year. Uh, and it was the first vacation I've taken in seven years. Like I just how many people are able to afford vacation? And this is in America, the greatest country on the planet. Right. Think about how much how, how it is in India. How many of those people are actually getting to take a vacation? It's the same thing, but if you can't afford to take a vacation, if you can't go to these foreign countries, if you can't experience other cultures, if you can't see how the rest of the world operates for your, for yourself, then it's easy to sell that lie. It's easy to sell that propaganda of this is the greatest country on the planet. It's that, that nationalistic pride. Same thing in India. They can't go outside of India, so they just think that this is how it operates everywhere. It must why would my country sell out the working class? It, it it has to work like this everywhere. India is being overrun by the tech industry, and the and there's a very good chance that you know fucking the, there there's going to be a a a major San Francisco happening in India. What I mean by that is San Francisco has been taken over by the tech industry, right? Um. It's been taken over by the tech industry. How's people can't afford to live there? They can't afford to work there. I've grown up around homeless people my entire life. In India, there's a lot of homeless people. There's a ton of them, um, and there's a whole system. There's a there's an economy run um, on homelessness connected to the to, to criminal behavior and all that sort of stuff. So it's a little different to find um, you know homeless people that aren't. But that's the thing is like when when a government doesn't take care of its homeless population, eventually they lead to criminal behavior because that's how they're going to survive. Right. That's all. But uh, usually people will come up and ask you for money. That's usually what homeless people do. Sometimes sometimes they have great stories. And my default is to usually listen and to offer them either food or money, depending on what I have more of at the time. Uh, sometimes it's food. Sometimes it's money, whatever. But in this instance, when I was in San Francisco, I walked through the streets. I, I like I couldn't find parking for a while, so we parked in this garage that was about half a mile away from my couch surfer. And we walked, and throughout that entire half mile walk, I mean, there were dozens of homeless people. Not one of them fucking talked to me. It was the most bizarre experience I've ever had in my life. We performed in the Tenderloin, is where I performed. 
uh, Mickey Huff was there, a uh, lovely gentleman, runs Project Censored. Him and his wife might have been the only two people that laughed at any of the anti-war shit that I was talking about. I mean, that city is not progressive. It's neoliberal as all hell. That's why fucking Nancy Pelosi got reelected there. Now, she also didn't engage with Shahid Batar, so not enough people really knew about Shahid Batar. I think more of the progressives communities knew about Shahid Batar, but the liberals and the staunch Democrats that believe that San Francisco and Portland, Oregon uh, and, and Asheville, North Carolina are these little bastions of progressivism, these little little towns that they have to protect. And no, they're all neoliberal cities. They're all neoliberal as all hell. And I, I've, you know, I, I, I face these people like they were very uncomfortable about talking about anti-war topics because even, even the liberal community associates being anti-war with being anti-veteran when in reality you're not. Anyway, I, I, that was a major deviation. But the, the point I'm trying to make is that's what's going to happen to India, where, where the, the, the cost of living is going to go up, the cost of food is going to go up, everything's going to go up, and the workers aren't going to get a, a wage increase, right? You're, you're going to see a shit ton of gentrification, and India parts of India are going to become like San Francisco, raging homeless population. People are going to be starving. There's going to be uh, empty buildings, empty businesses. The worst part about this is that, like I mentioned, there is a good portion of homelessness in India that is connected with the criminal underground because that's part of the business. So by creating this vacuum, by, by not being responsible within the tech industry of paying people properly and making sure that property rates don't go up in a country that is struggling to deal with this sort of stuff, you're creating more criminal behavior. It's manufacturing it. And ignoring that you are part of the problem. But a, a rule like this put into place that actually solidifies workers' rights, that ensures that the working class people are paid properly, are taken care of, aren't being overworked and overstressed all the time, would fucking mean that it's... It would be better. Uh, what else are they talking about? Uh, stop corporatization and privatization of government uh, run utilities like railways, right? Which is like a go figure. Like you shouldn't fucking have private corporations running utilities, right? Like look at what's happened to our internet, which should be a utility. The telecoms are running wild. We have a, a former FCC chair, Ajit Pai, that, uh, that basically killed net neutrality and was ready to just open the internet to whatever the whims of the fucking telecom industry, the whims of Verizon and Comcast. Go figure a fucking Verizon lobbyist would do that shit. The railway should not in India. That's one of the best parts about going to India is riding the rails. It's amazing. It's it's so great. I love I love taking the train when I was a kid there. When I when I went back there last year, I, I, that was one of my favorite parts. I love traveling by the train. I wish America would have a better rail system. I really do. Perhaps it was it was run by a decent government that gave a shit about its people. It wouldn't it wouldn't have turned into what it became now. It shouldn't run that. I mean, look at what happened in Flint. That was a private water industry. A private water company put, le put put a chemical that leached the lead out of the pipes. And then you have Obama going there and being like, no, 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 don't worry. Fucking, I'll drink the water. And then Nestle comes in and is like, I'll help. And they all work in cahoots with each other. It becomes, it becomes this over-privatized thing by just fucking taking, by, by privatizing water. Look at all the mess that it's caused. And you want to do that to all utilities? Holy shit. What kind of a world do you want to run? <laughs> this is also another no-brainer in my opinion. Uh, shin. Oh, wow. Okay. I think I just went blank there for like half a second. That was kind of scary. Uh, maybe my camera fritzed for a minute, but sorry about that. Uh, I feel like this again, a little bit of a no brainer is to not force people to retire, um, and not kill pensions. I, for, I mean, again, that's all just to funnel money up into some CEO's hands, right? To, to, to the partners, like they want to make more money. So they kind of force people out of their jobs. So it's, 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 
these demands are not fucking obscene. They're not over the top. And and nobody should make that claim. These demands are very reasonable and rational demands. They are demands that that need to be met in order to make sure that the working class people are taken care of. Who are the real economy? The, the stock market isn't the real economy. But the popularity contest that is the stock market is not the real economy. Um, I do have a bunch more shit to talk about, but I do want to look at some of these comments. Uh and because i know you guys are, are are commenting uh hello how's it going Kristen? good to see you thank you for joining the stream uh yeah jacobin magazine covered the proletariat supported uprising yeah uh jacobin is one of the uh, only places that talks about strikes uh where i got this story is from left voice and the people's dispatch uh and lee camp so there you go. It's two alternative independent media organizations that depend on people donating to them and two fucking comedians. That's who's talking about these strikes. Corporate media, the 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 cream of the crop in terms of journalism, not a fucking peep, right? Uh, and yes, the strike was happening on top of COVID uh, and all of the fucking atrocities that are uh, like they they poured bleach on top of like migrant workers in India, which was insane. And that was the BJP being like science. Am I right? Like that's and it's like, no, I don't think you understand the word science. <laughs> Hello, Camille. Uh, dang, I lived in India for three years. And when I lived there, the exchange rate was like 40 rupees a dollar. Yeah. Um, when I was when I left India in, in 97, I believe it was 51. Yeah. 51, 52 rupees uh, per dollar. Uh, it, yeah. The 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 rupee to dollar has fluctuated up and down. Um, and now it's at 73. So it's it's actually the, the value of the rupee has gone down. Uh, it's insane to have untouchables. What the hell? Yeah, <laughs> it is insane to have untouchables. Um, but, uh, you know, we have untouchables in America. It's homeless people and anybody that works in the fast food industry, anybody that works retail. Uh, you know, we just call it something um, in, in America. Um, yeah, the bootstraps mentality is what neoliberalism and conservatism are really about. And uh, we can't afford the boots. You're right, Suzanne. That's part of the problem. Uh, hello, Uli. Good to see you. Uh, COVID is hitting their rent bubbles now. Tech companies moving to Florida and Texas harder to pretend to be progressive there. Yeah, it is, and I think I think once they're there, they'll fall into the trap of uh, neoliberal capitalism and and conservative politics, and and you'll see a lot more quote unquote progressive companies. You know, the the ones where the CEOs have a beard and a nose ring. Whoa, crazy cool man they'll end up falling in line with, uh, you know, that, that's all that's all a facade to continue running corporate America the way that it's running. And and I think COVID is kind of changing that and they're nervous about it uh, because a lot more of those jobs can be done from home. You guys, uh, trains are awesome. I, that is, uh, I will say trains are probably my favorite mode of transportation. Uh, thanks for hanging out, Suzanne. Uh, and same in Europe, trains, everywhere privatized uh they privatized the system in germany prices skyrocketed and service went to shit yeah that's kind of the pattern of behavior it happens all the time um once you privatize stuff and that's part of the reason why the strike is talking about that is the privatization of of everything the commodification of everything um really kind of wrecks the industry because it's all about profit it's not about doing the right thing it's not about uh enjoying you know the the enjoying the rails like that should be a nice thing and it, you know it, it, people will if if they knew that that's what it was going to i think people would not mind paying a little higher taxes be, and if they knew that other people were paying those taxes too right so if the rich were paying their fair share of taxes i think people wouldn't mind the reason why people are feared about ra uh, you know the raising taxes and all that kind of stuff is because the rich don't pay their fair share so we feel like we're burdened by it that and and that is again it's a manufactured argument uh the strike in in india multiple different cities this happened in right because it was a general strike uh we're looking at delhi bombay mumbai i call it bombay because that's what i grew up with uh calcutta a bunch of urban and rural areas smaller cities also had the strike going on and as for usual uh, particularly in Delhi, they were met with violent police. Go figure. Strikers are met with violent police in India as well as America. That's kind of the way that uh, the this thing uh, worked out, right? Is um, 
they that's what happens everywhere when you meet the labor movement is the state's going to get pissed off and they're going to send in the military they're going to send in the 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 big guns the violent arm of everything and they're going to use cops to brutally beat the shit out of strikers and that's what they did pinkertons in america that was that was part of their job and in india they used tear gas they used blockades um and eventually, I mean, 250 million strikers, right? Uh, you got to figure in, in a city like Delhi, there's there's a prominent amount of people uh, that are going to be there that eventually broke through the, the blockade. Um, now, according to Left Voice, uh, they said that uh, the working class must expand the strike. And I agree with that, right? Basically, the, the two major unions that organized this strike organized it for one day. And I think if you really want to make an impact, this is amazing, but it would have it, it, it should have kept going. And one of the things with strikes that people forget often is that solidarity is important. In 1919 in Seattle, when they were in strike, it wasn't like they shut down and everybody starved for five days. No, for those five days, there was an efficiently run system because it was run by organizers, not politicians, right? It was run by people that gave a shit about the community, not their own wallets. And they fed people. They fed 30,000 people at five different food locations. Um, they delivered milk to families' houses. They still kept the lights on at the hospital and took care of patients. And there was a, a National Guardsman, because the National Guard was called into Seattle, said they've never seen the city this well run before. And that's what happens. That's what happens when you have people that give a shit about the community. They give a shit about people at large and not profits. And that's why this is so dangerous to people. To, to 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 the elites, to the to the neoliberals, to conservatives, right? It's they want you to need the government, but not all, all the time. And this basically shows you how a government should run. This shows you that the that a government is capable of feeding and clothing and making sure people are taken care of. That's the really scary part about strikes. That's the truly, ooh, whoops. Uh, that's the truly, truly terrifying part about strikes to the neoliberals. Is we figure out that that their government system, this capitalistic run government system, doesn't actually take care of people. In fact, it causes more misery. And we don't need to be stuck in that. There's actually a different way of running things based on compassion, understanding, and intelligence, rather than profit, profit, and more profits. Now, this is not the first time this has happened in India. In 2016, something very similar happened. Um, in 2016, India went on a nationwide strike again, a big general strike again, and uh, they, uh, it was 150 million at that time. And again, it was fighting against neoliberal economic policies that were claiming that India was amazing, right? Hey, what's up, everybody? Thank you guys so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed the content in this video, make sure you like, subscribe, and share. My content is highly suppressed because this is not topics of conversation that uh, that the corporate mainstream media really wants to, to, to address here. So make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Uh, sign up for my email list. Uh, that way you'll get weekly uh, emails with all of the podcasts and all of the videos that I put out there. Um, and make sure you go to my website and follow me there, uh, krishmohanhaha.com. That's going to be your one-stop shop for all things Krish Mohan. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. See you in the next video.